Welcome to St. John's Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Steve Craig. It's the third Sunday of Advent. We're here again to worship here in person and also online. If you're online today, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. There are so many folks who are worshiping with us online, including my own parents. And so we're grateful for the online option for a lot of the members and friends of our church. If you are online today, please remember to write your name in the chat window, introduce yourself to us, and know that any time during the service, you can click the request prayer button, and the live prayer host will join you in a private chat room where you can share whatever that prayer need might be, and we'll come alongside you in prayer at that time. Just a reminder again, as I am wearing a mask, we're still asking you as a congregation to wear your masks when you come to worship, so we appreciate your compliance for your own health and the health of others. I do want to remind you again, let's continue to be praying for Bill Augustine. Uh, Bill had to go back into the hospital again uh, this past week, and he's just had a, a, a challenging time recovering from the, the hip surgery that he had several months ago. So let's continue to pray for Bill and also for Rita. And also immediately after today's worship service, the election of church officers will be taking place as Pat Whiting brings the report of the nominating committee. We're so grateful for all of our spiritual leaders. And then, this is a very special uh, Sunday at 2 p.m., the Celtic Choir will be sharing a special Christmas concert with us right here in the sanctuary. It's pre-recorded, but you can watch it here and get refreshments afterwards or you can watch online and get your own refreshments. And either way, it's going to be fantastic. Julie Hollinger here, our choir director, and all of our choir members, it's going to be very special. And now, I want to introduce and, and welcome Abraham and Lucy Ajaqua. Abraham is an elder and servant leader of our church. He works in special education and mental health, aiding many with disabilities and those struggling with addiction. Lucy is a dedicated nurse who works long hours. When a local convalescent hospital had a COVID-19 outbreak right here in our area, Lucy was one of the first nurses who willingly, willingly put her own health at risk to help that hospital and their patients. She went right in to help them out. And they're another beautiful couple here at St. John's, and they are here today to light the third candle of Advent. Abraham and Lucy, I'm so glad to see you both today. Thank you so much, Pastor Steve. I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Why do we light the third candle? I will light the third candle, the candle of love. It reminds to remind us that Christ came to show us God's perfect, self-giving love. A love that never ends. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall, should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be served through him. John 3, 16, 17. Beloved, let us love one another. Because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. For God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the year.
into the world so that we might live through him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 9. Let us pray. God of love, on this third Sunday of Advent, we thank you, we thank you for the gift of your perfect self-giving love which we have heard and seen and felt through the gift of your son. We thank you that when we did not love you, you loved us for through your son, you took upon yourself our sin and shame dead on, on a cross and rose again. Whether we are at home or in this sanctuary today, may the God, may the good news of your love bless in your heart by your Holy Spirit. And may your name be praised and exalted through every song that is sung, every word that is spoken, every prayer that is offered to you through Christ our Lord. We pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, St. John's. I hope you're having a wonderful Christmas season, whether you're in the sanctuary, at home, wherever you are. It's a wonderful time to praise together. So let's join in one heart, one soul, one mind, and sing some songs of praise. <laughs>
this morning. We thank you for bringing us living water, Lord. Um, just this eternal life that you promise us. We thank you so much for sending your son. And we praise your name here at Christmas time. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> to greet one another. The children are excused to Sunday school at this time. If you're online, say hi in that chat function if you haven't done so already. If you're in the sanctuary, let's take a moment to uh, make our way around the room right now and say hi to our friends and church family. Have a good week. <laughs>
Welcome again to our Welcome again to worship and boys and girls I want to remind you again you are dismissed to Sunday school. Nancy Ashley is going to be sharing a children's ministry update. We did find a glitch on one of the slides. That was my fault. If it said two o'clock for the election of church officers, that was incorrect. That's that's the uh, the Celtic choir concert that's at two. Immediately after the service, we're going to have a brief congregational meeting. So we hope you can join us then. Good morning. <laughs> My name's Nancy Ashley, and I'd like to start off by saying a big, huge thank you to everybody who participated in the Advent workshop last Sunday. It was a great success and so much fun. You know, it really does take a village, that expression. Everybody helped so much. We could not have pulled it off without everybody's support. This month in Sunday School, we are learning about the greatest gift that God gave us, and that is Jesus, and that we can celebrate Christmas all year long, and Christmas is a character of, of God. So the memory verse has been sent home. It's John 3.16, so that's going to be kind of fun for the kids to memorize. And parents, I send, we send home the memory verse and the devotional every month, so if you're not getting it, if your kids aren't getting it, let me know so I can make sure I have the correct mailing address for you. Um, for our rooted students, uh, that's our youth group for middle schoolers and high schoolers. Um, let's see, for our rooted students, the rooted Christmas party is next Sunday, the 19th, from 4 to 7 o'clock. And we have great news that this year our kids get to go to winter camp. So if you want more details about winter camp, see Jenna at the table on the patio after church, after the, after the congregational meeting as well. I'd like to share uh, some words of hope from a Christian foreign journalist who's worked throughout the Middle East. She says, I see a richly tapestried world of beauty and of need beyond the, the United States shores. There the gospel is having its way in beleaguered hearts and Christianity is on the rise in the way it uniquely does rise, not as a conquering battle master, but as a suffering servant, reviving the faint and giving hope to the weary. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, during this Christmas season, may we remember that Jesus' birth brings us the promise of hope beyond our circumstances. The prophet Isaiah tells us he would be despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Thank you that it's through his deep trials that new life can be born in us as it is being born around the world. Forgive us when we fail to recognize your amazing sacrifice, your familiarity with pain that understands our own pain. In the midst of what might seem like ashes and despair, bring us face to face with your unyielding love, knowing that you won't leave us here that you have lessons yet to teach us. Grow our faith. May we honor your name by joining that great cloud of witnesses who encourage others by proclaiming the work you've done in our own lives. We lift up our pastors and spiritual leaders around the world for protection, wisdom, and strength to persevere as they continue the precious work of bringing your word and guiding our churches. Thank you for your answers to their prayers. We pray for our youth. May they be like Joseph, seeing challenge as part of your greater plan to mold their lives into something beautiful. We pray for those still seeking you. From citizens and refugees around the world, to those who may be here this morning, for those affected by the tornadoes across our nation, for the brokenness we see in our families, our cities, our nation, 
and the world. For those on our prayer list, and there are many, but we particularly lift up our church staff and our missionaries, our sister church, the Fuente de Vida Presbyterian Church, and our Westside Pastors Fellowship, the Augustine family, and so many other families that are facing challenges these days. All of those on our prayer list and those whose names you've placed on our heart this morning, take a moment now to add those prayers. You sent out your word in the name of Jesus to heal our diseases, to comfort the afflicted, to bring light to those dwelling in darkness. Thank you for bearing our grief and carrying our sorrows, knowing in this joyous season that it's by your wounds that we are healed. Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
let's join in prayer. We welcome you, Emmanuel. We welcome you, Lord. Lord of Christmas. We pray that you would open our hearts again to receive your word and that it would live in us today. Help us to hear you well and to allow you to do the healing and restoring work that you alone can do in each one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we're reading from Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 18, as we continue an Advent series we're calling Living Streams of Christmas Faith. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they had lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Amen. This Advent, we're looking at living streams of tradition relative to the Christmas story, living streams of the church. Each of these streams has something vital to say about the meaning of Jesus' birth, but together they form a mighty river, revealing the true power and glory of Jesus' coming, our Emmanuel, God with us. The first of these streams of Christmas faith we called the prophetic stream. The second I'm going to call the charismatic stream because it celebrates the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing Jesus into this world and into our lives. At Christmas, we honor how the Spirit brings Christ into the chaos. Let me say that again. At Christmas, we honor how the Spirit brings Christ into the chaos. Genesis 1, 1 to 2 tells us that in the beginning, the earth was formless. The earth was a formless void. I like Gordon Wenham's translation. In the beginning, the earth was total chaos. In the earth was total chaos, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Show me a situation of total chaos and I'll show you a situation in which the Spirit of God is at work, moving and blowing. The Spirit loves to bring light into the darkness. The Spirit loves to bring hope from despair and life where there is nothing alive. So let's fast forward to Matthew chapter one, verse one, where we read about a different Genesis story where Matthew writes the account of the genealogy, literally the genesis of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Matthew takes pains to remind us just how chaotic Jesus' family line was. And if we had time on closer inspection, and we have done so before in the past, we would discover that our Lord's family line was filled with the famous and the infamous, the saints, and the sinners, and those who were a little bit of both, just like you and me. <laughs> Several Gentile foreigners were completely outside the family of Israel in Jesus' family line. And it's out of this creative chaos that the Spirit brings the Messiah. I think that at this time of year, a lot of us can be tempted to compare their lives with the Christmas picture postcard family, and we can feel discouraged by the chaos in our own families, the chaos in our own history as we look back, sometimes with regret. That temptation 
can really drag us down, especially at this time of year. But the scriptures remind us that we're not alone, that if we lay alone at night wondering about the future, so did Joseph. That if we have felt the sting of prejudice like outsiders, the shepherds understood that too. That if we have troubled families that don't understand us, well, Jesus knew what that was like as well, as we know that some of his brothers didn't really believe in him until after the resurrection and even doubted his ministry. And that if you come here feeling far from God, take heart. The Spirit is definitely not far from you. But secondly, at Christmas, we honor how the Spirit fills us from life's beginning to life's unending. Remember the angel word to Joseph. Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived or genesis in her is from the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you a question. When did the Spirit's work begin in the story of Jesus? When did the Spirit's work begin in the story of Jesus? Did it begin at his birth in Bethlehem's manger? Did it begin at conception when Jesus was just a single cell, a zygote in Mary's womb? The scriptures remind us that there was never a time when the Spirit was not at work. For even before the Word became flesh in a single cell, the Spirit was at work in Mary and in Joseph and in the prophets and the generations before them going all the way back to creation itself, the Spirit who brings life and who brings the Messiah, the Christ, into the world, the Word made flesh. And not only is this true about Jesus, but also God was preparing for our birth before we were born, before our parents, parents, parents were born, before time and space, we were already conceived in the mind of God. How about that? Chosen in Christ, as Paul says, before the foundation of the world. Look that up in Ephesians chapter 1. Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. You were in God's mind. But that's not all. The Spirit is at work not only in our physical birth, but also in our spiritual birth. In Galatians 4, 6, we read that God longs to send the spirit of his son into our hearts, literally into our spirits. That's what the Greek text says. He wants to send his spirit into our spirits. Jesus said we must be born of the spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. Our human spirit may be exhausted by life today. How many of you have an exhausted spirit right now as a result of the last two years. Join the family. Weighed down by past sins, unfulfilled longings maybe, fearful of the future, at odds with God, and maybe a few other people. But you are never too young or too old to be born anew of the Spirit of God. We can begin unending life in Christ. We can become a new creation, as Paul says. For if anyone is in Christ, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You are a new creation. And we can pray for that life to begin in others as well. That new creation to begin in our children, in our neighbors, in our work associates. It begins with that prayer. Lord, may they know you, may they be born anew, and may I be renewed by your spirit. May each one listening open their spirit, Lord, to your Holy Spirit today, the spirit of Christ, that we might be filled with God's fullness and experience the healing of hurts and the forgiveness of wrongs and the power of faith and hope and love. Lord, send your Holy Spirit into us. 
And finally, at Christmas, we honor the Spirit's power to name us and to send us. To name us and to send us. Names are important. They were really important in the first century. Joseph was instructed to name the child Jesus, for he will save his people for their sins. Yeshua means God saves, or God to the rescue, which tells us two things. One, who Jesus is, God come in the flesh, and two, what Jesus was sent to do, to save us from the things that are destroying us in our relationships with God and each other in the world, to save us from sin and evil and death, and restore us to a right relationship with God and one another and with the earth. There's a pattern in the Gospels that we see repeatedly, a pattern that we also see today. When people are filled with the Spirit of Jesus, they too come to know who they are and what they are called to do. Who they really are and what in their deepest sense of calling in life they were born to do. They come to know their true name and they come to know their true purpose. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, Paul says, crying, Abba, or daddy, a beloved term. Abba, father, so, Paul says, you are no longer a slave, but what? You're a child. Paul says, actually here, a son, which you could also say a son or a daughter or a child of God. In other words, you're part of the family. And if a child, Paul says, then also an heir. An heir through God. Parents choose the names of their children pretty carefully. They really ruminate on that one. Often with the intention of speaking some kind of a blessing over them. Or maybe just choosing a name that other people won't misuse, right? Something that's bulletproof, fail safe. But they want to bless their children with their names. But still, a lot of us find it difficult to receive that blessing. I think of Joseph in the story of Jesus' birth, whose name means God will bring an increase. God will bring an increase. Like the Joseph of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, who rises from slavery, slavery to be ruler in Egypt. He continued to increase by the grace and power of God. But Joseph never forgets who he was and who he is. Never forgets where he came from. Never forgets who he serves. And Joseph, in our story today, never forgets who he was either. He could have been enslaved by shame or suspicion and anger, accusing Mary publicly of adultery. He could have been enslaved by a domineering legalism and had her publicly stoned on the suspicion that she had had relations with another man before they had even been officially married. Instead, he chose to respond with gentleness and with mercy, knowing all of those things could have been possible. Filled with God's spirit, Joseph never forgot his name, never forgot who he was, that he was not a slave, but a child of God. And he was free, free to increase in faith and hope and love like we've been learning about recently. Like Joseph, the spirit has set us free from labels like resentful, unloved, unforgive, and unforgiving. We have new, name now, new names now written on our hearts. Names like beloved, free, merciful, and just. I'm thinking about William Joseph Seymour, born the son of slaves. William grew up in Louisiana amidst the KKK and racial, racial segregation. From a young age, he dreamed of racial justice and racial reconciliation, but it wasn't, it wasn't until he sensed that he had been filled with the spirit of Jesus in a racially mixed Ohio church that he saw how this dream could come true. After pursuing as much Bible education as he was allowed, 
in a segregated Houston, a prayer group in Los Angeles asked him to come and help them establish a holiness church. But when Seymour arrived, he began teaching not only about holiness, but about the Holy Spirit's power to make all nations and races into one family. And that made a few people very nervous in his church. (laughs) Then something happened on April the 9th, 1906, when a janitor and a member of the prayer group began to speak in languages that they did not know. He had a, what sometimes is called a charismatic experience, though we know that the charisma of the Spirit is manifested in many different ways, and that was just one. And as Seymour continued preaching at the home of the evening prayer service, it was known, well known, and it's been written about for years since, Jenny Evans Moore went to the piano, which she did not play, and began playing flawlessly and singing in six foreign languages that she had never learned. As the prayer meetings continued in the old two-story building on Azusa Street, right here in Los Angeles, Men and women poured in from the community, 800 more each night, 500 more outside, Ethiopians, Chinese, Indians, Mexicans, brown, white, black. Seymour had this to say, the color line was washed away in the blood. The people are all melted together. They're made one lump, one bread, all one body in Christ Jesus. William Seymour said. An eyewitness later wrote, no choir, no collections taken, no church organization, a two-story whitewashed old building. You'd hardly expect heavenly visitations here unless you remembered the stable at Bethlehem. So from Bethlehem to Azusa Street to National Boulevard, The Spirit blows where it wills. Despite our best efforts, we can't control the Spirit. We can't domesticate the Spirit, but we can do what Joseph did. We can do what Mary did. We can do what William Seymour did. We can surrender to the Spirit of the Son and welcome the Spirit into our own hearts, following where Christ leads. And when we do this, we'll be drinking from one of the great streams of Christmas faith. Let's think about that in this moment of silent prayer. Holy Spirit of God, I thank you for entering the chaos of this world. And now let's pray to God and together. I thank you for reminding me that nothing in me or my own family is beyond your grace and your healing touch. I'm awed that you chose me in Christ before time began and that your plans for me are good. Therefore, I turn from sin and doubt And I ask you to cleanse and heal me of my sin. And I welcome you, the Spirit of Christ, into my spirit who loved me and gave himself for me. Thank you for calling me your beloved child, for giving me the gift of death-conquering life, and for sending me into the world with the good news of your redeeming love. Thank you for giving me new power to follow Jesus as I pray. Holy Spirit of Christmas, 
be glorified in me today and every day of my life. Amen. And I want to say again, when you pray a prayer like that for the first time, you're beginning a journey with Christ, a never-ending journey. And we are having the Alpha Course in January, and I want to invite you to be a part of that. You'll hear more about it in the coming weeks. It's an introduction to the Christian faith. And for some of you online, some of you here even in person, you may want to walk that journey with me and George Bauer. It's a beautiful way to enter into that life with Christ and also to come, become reacquainted with that incredible message in uh, the, the, the Christian life. Right now we're going to sing one of the few songs, actually, one of the few Christmas carols that actually mentions the work of the Holy Spirit. There actually aren't that many. So see if you can find it as we sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Let's stand and sing. Come thou long expected Jesus Born to set thy people free From our fears an in-person worshiper today, remember, we would love to pray with you, but we can't do it today, <laughs> immediately after the service, because we're having a congregational meeting. But if you stick around afterwards, I would love to pray with you then. So just know that you can come afterwards for prayer. If you're online, remember, the congregational meeting begins immediately after this service, so just stay with us, and you can participate in the service online. Also, remember, after the worship service, you can still visit the Alternative Christmas Fair table. I believe Jim Lamb will be out there if you continue want to make a donation to uh, some of the ministries that were featured last week. That was a beautiful service, I thought, and to be able to hear each of those ministries and others. I'm happy to announce again, I want to say one more time, the Alpha Course, a practical introduction to the Christian faith, will begin in January on the 9th. And Alpha is for anyone who wants to grow in their knowledge and experience of the Christian faith. Talk to me, talk to George. Raise your hand, George, uh, if you want to know more about Alpha. And immediately after today's service, again, stick around for the election of church officers. And then at 2 p.m., what's happening? Right back here in the sanctuary, we get to experience the Celtic Choir's con Christmas Cantata, Heaven's Child, at 2 p.m. It is pre-recorded because of health guidelines. But you can watch it together here and get the food and the fellowship afterwards. 
or you can watch it at home and get your own food and fellowship afterwards. Either way, it's going to be great, and we hope that you'll be there. And now let's receive the Lord's benediction this morning. Now may the true spirit of Christmas go with you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you in obedient ministry, above you to watch over you, within you to give you power, and before you to show the way. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.